Well, hello, uh, good evening, everyone. If you are in Toronto, otherwise, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica David, and I am uh, here to talk about the revolution of our Python monorepo, um, the road we traveled in the search for Zen. If you were here back in March, you will realize that this talk is not really that clever, the title that is, but we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so first of all, hi, if you haven't met me, um, I am a security data engineer at Elastic. Um, I had do a lot of pushing of data and wearing of hats and have for the past uh, eight years or so. And I am also a very devoted cat mom, as you can see from this beautiful photo of Xander, my cat. He's always a good way to start a presentation so we can get up on, the, on a good foot. <laughs> so uh, for this uh, talk, I'm going to talk a little about how did we get here. Um, if you were at my talk in March, you will know that we have moved our Python code into a mono repo. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We'll do a little recap. We're going to talk about what's gone well with that process in the coming months since then, where we've fallen short, and what does the future hold for our beautiful mono repo. Uh, although I do want to bring this up one more time. This slide was also my last presentation, but I thought it would be good just in case you, you need a refresher or you weren't there. What even is a monorepo? Um, it is short for monolithic repository and refers to a repository where instead of having multiple projects and multiple repos, you have them all in one. Uh, uh, the counter would be a polyrepo or a multi-repo. Um, if you have like microservices and they're all in their own separate repositories, that would be kind of one example of that. Um, but the monorepo is used at Google, Facebook, and a bunch of places. Um, I left a very helpful wiki link here in case you want to learn a little bit more about it. We're not going to talk really about the specifics of what a monorepo is, but how it kind of applies to my use case and uh, how I've been using it um, in my team at Elastic. So how did we get here to November 2021? And we'll recap a little bit of what I chatted about last time. So. To set some context, I want to talk about who my team is at Elastic, who we are at Elastic. Um, I am part of the protections team at Elastic. Uh, we protect the world's data from attack. We are a sub team of the security team and the team has security researchers and data scientists who make um, uh, artifacts for the Elastic security endpoint. So back about a year and a half ago now, Elastic released Elastic Security. Uh, you can run a, a beta version, at least think of GA maybe a year ago. You can uh, use Elastic Security on your um, computer like you would any kind of like antivirus software. And it uses the awesome protections that my teammates make to uh, protect your data. So protect you from malware, ransomware, et cetera. There's various tiers of features, but it's really awesome. Um, and as a security data engineer, what I do is I help with gathering user telemetry. So if alerts fire on your machine, they get set back up and we can use alerting to help with preventing future attacks, um, as well as third party uh, public security research and intel that we can feed in uh, that kind of data to help with our analysis as well. So yeah, my team is mostly responsible for automating pipelines, enables the rest of the protections team to continuously improve our security products. We wanna get uh, protections out the door as quick as possible to make sure that your, uh, your data and your computers are safe. So what is in our mono repo and the TLDR is all the things, um, but just at a very high level, we have production code, obviously, which we have Python, OCaml and Go code. So at least three programming languages here. Um, various test suites, this includes our synthetic tests, which run against production every so often, um, all of our infrastructure and CI code, so Docker files, Terraform, Jenkins uh, job definitions, etc. Um, we have some security artifact codes, so some security develop artifact developers use our repository to write the logic that generates their artifacts, which get deployed onto the endpoints. A um, bunch of documentation, we'll talk more about that later and much, much more. It's a very wide, vast uh, uh, landscape of things. Um, so back when I talked in March, you'll see the talk title was the evolution of our Python monorepo, thus the not very crude nature of this title of this talk. We, by this point in March, 2021, we have mostly consistent Python tooling across all of our projects. We've moved all of our projects over to Poetry for the most part, and Poetry is what we're using for like our dependency management and some building and running uh, uh, features. We've moved a lot of our uh, code to make files to be able to run targets consistently across multiple projects. So for example, a bunch of our projects will have a build target if we want to make Python executables, which is great. 
Um, we set up pre-commit hooks for linting. So that way, if you change code, it would check to make sure it's linted all nice. And we were at the very beginnings of starting to automate a lot of this in our CI. So that's kind of where our monorepo was at a very high level back in March. Uh, I believe Selena linked my talk from March. If you want to get a lot more details about that, you should go check that out if you want to see where we were then. But there's been some other kind of really fun developments in the past six months that are tangentially related to the monorepo that I did want to point out. Our team has grown. I believe we have at least four new data and machine learning engineers uh, since I last chatted with you, if not five, which is awesome. Um, automation has become top priority uh, in our team because we want to be getting things out the door as quickly as possible. And this involves doubling down on Jenkins, uh, which was an internal decision for the tooling we'll be using for CI moving forward. Um, and we had our first Python guild meeting in October. So internally at Elastic now, all the Pythonistas that wanted to kind of came together on one afternoon in October. We chatted about how we use uh, Python across our teams. Um, because it's a chance to share ideas and techniques. And I'm actually giving an iteration of this talk next week, because internally at Elastic, not a lot of people know what my team does. So I'm going to be talking to them about this too, because I think that a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is really relevant, Python or not even. So yeah, th that's a fun development, and it'll come into it'll come into play a little bit later. So since March of 2021, what has gone well? What have we done in our mono repo that has been awesome? So the first thing is we have a greater division of our pull request and main branch jobs. So when I chatted with you last time, we rebuilt the world every single PR. Um, we no longer do that. So PRs now no longer take 10, 15 minutes to run, depending on the size of the jobs and depending what goes on. It can sometimes either take 15, 20 seconds or maybe five minutes or so to do all the builds and things. So that's really great. And that's very exciting. Um, we could also rebuild on multiple dependencies. So if we have a library that updates along with a service, we can rebuild both in one set of PR jobs instead of like, being to, again, either build the entire world or do multiple PRs to make updates. So that's really awesome. Um, another really awesome thing for our CI and CD is we now have um, uh, a Python base image in our internal Docker hubs. So what that means is we basically can use now a standard and consistent Python image across all of our like Python services. So now we don't have to copy someone else's Docker file over. We don't have to copy lines from, from other Docker files into ours if we need a common functionality. We're starting to be able to have this um, common resource basically, which is something that has been really helpful. Um, we now don't need to worry about like where packages are or aren't installed and we can have a nice consistent build, which um, will build on our main merge tags with a commit hash. So that way, if you're like, hey, I want this specific Docker image build and I don't want any new updates from there, you can lock in and not have to uh, worry about breaking on latest. So that's been really awesome. Um, to accomplish this not rebuilding the whole world, we are using a multi job in Jenkins. Um, this. I should have put like warning hack ahead <laughs> at the top of this slide because uh, this is a little bit hacky. Fair warning. Um, we use a tool called Jenkins Job Builder um, in conjunction with uh, the multi job uh, parameter enable condition. We have a little Python script essentially that runs when you create, when you commit to a PR and it will check hey, what has changed from this commit hash from the main branch? And essentially that helps us get a list of files that have been changed. And we then use a regular expression to be like, hey, if this condition matches, like if, if a file has changed, it's in this regular expression, please kick off this Jenkins job. This is mostly to get around um, a bit of a, um, from what we found is like a little bit of a catch in Jenkins where it's hard to like have projects, de like dependent projects run and just simply build in that logic into Jenkins itself. Um, again, if we had not a mono repo, this might be easier, but with how this runs in our, in our current setup, we found this is the best way to do it. So yeah, so if, if we match, it will run and it's parallelized for all matches. So I think I mentioned in the last slide, like if we have a library and a service that need to update, uh, they can build, uh, simultaneously or they can build one after another, we have some options there. Um, so this has been super helpful for us because it allows us to grow our repo and grow the jobs without growing our build time, which is really important for us. 
Um, and then some Python specific wins. We have a lot wider use of our standard library. Uh, we have an internal deployment coming soon, but at least within our repository, a lot of things are using our standard lib. Um, since we're the security data engineering team, we call it SDE lib. Uh, lint checks across the board. We have such beautiful Python in the repository now, and at least makes me very happy. So that's good. Um, we made some small improvements uh, to we have a cookie cutter project template that sits at the root of our repository. So if you want to make a new Python project, you can run like cookie cutter, give me a project, and it will dump out a template that is flake and black compliant. It also will dump out some templates for our Jenkins job. So that way you don't also have to then copy and paste a Jenkins job. We're still working on expanding that a little bit. We have mostly a lot of refactoring going on right now rather than new service development. So for us, this is a little bit on the back burner, but when our new data scientists came on, they were really excited and helped with improving that to help them get a couple things up and running. And we've moved tons of things to our new make file setup um, and using poetry. Uh, we use we were using please build for a while, um, but uh, we found it just didn't quite uh, hit all the marks for us. Make doesn't necessarily either, but we found it to be the lesser of um, two evils at this point. Uh, a lot of stuff about make is not very good in terms of a repository and please and basil and other tools like that are much more aware of like where they are in a repo um we've had some hacks around that or for you know sometimes you just have to make a couple hacks but there were a few places where we fell short and i will note here as i go into this we had many technical wins and a lot of the stuff that you're going to see in these next few slides are not super technical and i'll you'll see why um, the first one is we have a lot of places where we slow ourselves down. Um, so one of them is communicating clearly. Um, and in the mono repo, I find that this is especially important because if only one person gets asked a question, like if you're stuck in someone's DMs on Slack or on Gchat or wherever you chat, a lot of knowledge gets lost there. Um, and more people can answer your questions in public spaces. I try as hard as possible to get people into the public slack channel that we have so it can be like hey i have a problem with this pr i'm not sure why the checks aren't working or i have a problem here i don't know why this is working and being able to answer that question in public means that the users of our repository and people who want to get in there have better visibility um or people can make github issues which i think is a lot more beneficial and then it gets tied back into the repo itself um and if we here's a second point poor documentation it's probably a little bit harsher than it needs to be we have tons of docs but as you can see from these two items here, they go stale if they are updated, and it's hard to find the docs you need. And for us in our mono repo setup, where we fall short really here is how to set up your dev environment, because there is right now just a few things that are required at a base level to make sure you have a smooth experience, no matter where you are in the repository. Um, but if you can't find that documentation or someone hasn't updated it in six months, it can be really hard to figure out how to set yourself up for success. Uh, and also, we still have kind of a little bit of a bus problem. This, this very much relates to the top two points, um, where if only one person knows the ins and outs of the mono repo, it's not good. Uh, if you don't know what the bus problem is, it's a little dire. It's if your team or if your coworker, sorry, gets hit by a bus, is someone going to know what to do <laughs> in the repo? Um, it's a little, it's very harsh. I do understand. But just assume, like, if you go on vacation, are you OK? to like leave the repository open for everybody else. Like if you need to take the day off because you need to go get, you know, COVID tested, you just are taking a mental health day. Like, will your team be okay? And communicating in public, having GitHub issues, documenting things well are three things that are going to avoid that in your one-stop shop for code. <laughs> we also have the still, the still doesn't work on my machine problem. Uh, again, ties back heavily to the last slide, and this is kind of where some of the technical stuff uh, kicks in. We still have some problems with our pre-commit hook. Um, the black version is usually the culprit here of when someone sets up their local dev environment, they have black version 20.7 installed, but our pre-commit hooks run on 21.2 and even these small like version updates in black make slightly different results, which will mean when you run pre-commit locally, linting in CI then does something different. And it's very stressful for devs who just want to get PRs in. Um, they're like, I don't care about this. I just want to get a PR in. Why does your mono repo ruin my PR? Um, and also, it just turns out we all Python a little differently. Our new data scientists really like Conda over VM. 
they don't understand why we need to have typed Python code, which that's a debate for another PyLadies talk. Um, or they use Vim or VS Code or Notepad or PyCharm or any other IDE that they find most comfortable. And we try not to marry our monorepo to and to like an IDE. Like a lot of us use VS Code, but you shouldn't be able to use the monorepo only if you use VS Code. Uh, in some people's minds, like I can see kind of like how that argument goes both ways. Like if you're going to have a mono repo, you should have consistency in some ways. But we have a lot of very opinionated Pythonistas on our team. And I don't think this is a bad thing per se, but it does help slow us down in terms of like getting the repo like in a good solid place for every team member we have. The philosophical questions continue otherwise. Um, we have deeper questions now like you know, why are we only picking one technology? Can we make it so the repo works with any technology and any work streams? You can see it on the, the right here. I had this photo in my last presentation and, you know, you can see like, you know, the, the Socratic uh, uh, wants poetry, but the pl pl platonics want pip, but why not both? Like why, why only restrict it to only one or the other? And these are things that we're starting to come across more as our team grows. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, also just global requirements versus project requirements. Like what if the data scientists want to only use Conda and theirs? Why should we restrict it at a global level? Or why should we only have like linting rules at a global level? Can we not make them all project level? Um, do we need to pin to a specific version of requests across the board to make sure that everybody's up to date on security updates? There's, there's a lot of like really good debate that goes on here, but it does make it hard to progress sometimes. And that brings us to where do we go from here? Um, so my next metaphor is forks in the road. Um, we kind of, when we need to make a decision about what to do in the model repo, we sort of have one, one or more paths, at least one path, I should say, to go down. Like, do we want to go down column A or B in terms of like structuring code and making things accessible for everybody who comes in here? Um, and so to help overcome these forks, you know, we're talking about like, do we have freedom to choose your own path? And if another path is, uh, needs to be taken, do we help assisting with people? Because like our repository is technically owned by the data engineering team, but we also don't want to become like, like the only stewards of it. So this is a really delicate balance we're still trying to strike. Um, and how do you put multiple drivers on the road? Like down Python Boulevard that we have created, like how do you support like all these cars and not get into you know a big accident or a big traffic jam? We have at least 15 devs, if not more, that are now actively working in our repository. So it's really hard to try and balance everybody's like dev comfort zone. So how do you do that? And is there a way we can automate like which path to go down, like help with you know expanding out Jenkins, like writing more scripts, directing people to those. So we want to help overcome forks in the road without having a trolley problem. The trolley problem is when you have to pick, you have two very kind of bad choices ahead of you and you need to make a decision and it's a big philosophical dilemma. So we don't want it to be that we just have constant trolley problems where every option is bad. So we ourselves do not want to be agents of chaos. We don't want both paths to take away from any developer experience. Um, I pulled this quote from our last presentation of indecision is the enemy of progress, where you try to panic or find yourself making hasty choices just because you feel like you have to do something to help someone along. But also, no one to take the L. Maybe something doesn't actually need to be in the mono repo, and it's okay. Feelings aren't going to be hurt if you decide to pull something out into another repository because you'd rather have the additional freedom of making these choices for yourself. And that leads me to like kind of my last point: is Pythonistas are humans too. We're all people. We're all devs in a very stressed out situation sometimes, just trying to get our code out, trying to help people, trying to do the best we can. So, remember. Teamwork makes the dream work. You get to know your devs and the human element behind their work. Like, make sure you understand where they're coming from. So it seems like your, their requests in your repository like aren't that crazy, and you want to make sure that everybody has a really good dev experience. Always lend a helping hand. Be willing to support others if there are issues, um, and have an open mind if they come forth and being like, "Hey, this doesn't work for us." Um, this actually came up very in a very big way today, like literally an hour ago or so. <laughs> Um, in our repository, we require merging main back in before it will rerun CI checks. Um, and our data scientists are into a lot of problems with that because they had a kind of an older staler PR sitting around and when they tried to merge main back in, 
it had a conflict and said there were 400 plus files that had changed the PR when in reality there were two. And this was kind of hard for them. They're like, this, this doesn't really help. And so I was like, hey, let, let us know if you need something. We can always address and change things. Like we've made decisions back when the monorepo had six devs in it. And now that we're getting bigger, changes are gonna have to happen and it's okay. And it's part of our source code. One of the reasons I love being at Elastic is we have a set of company values, which you call our quote unquote source code. And it's in there to like, you know, listen with understanding, be humble, but ambitious, um, try not to assume malice, know that everybody kind of communicates and talks a different way and be flexible. And that's kind of built into who we are as elasticians. And it's something I try and take into every interaction I have with people who have issues in our repo, especially because in the past few months, I've sort of moved into this more administrative place and I'm dealing with a lot more people who have a lot more opinions. So the TLDR is, you know, be, uh, I know empathetic and empathy is a word tossed around a lot, but listen to people and try to see where they're coming from and be more understanding if you have a big repo with many users. And that's it. I know this is maybe less Python focused as my last one, but I feel like a lot of the things I've learned in the past six months have been really about the human side of decisions, like whether or not you choose a mono or poly repo. So I kind of wanted to reflect a little bit on those as well as some of the Python wins we had. Um, and just in general, follow up in case you were curious how things went. Uh, this is how you can get in touch with me. I, if you are live tweeting, that's great. I do not have a Twitter though. I, I left it about four years ago and it was great for my brain. So I do uh, hope you are tweeting. Um, but yeah, you can find me on GitHub and the Pylee Slack at Jessica. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, come say hi. Uh, my little website just has mostly pictures of my cat. Um, and we're hiring at Elastic, maybe not a ton of Python positions right now, but keep an eye out. And if you ever want to chat about what it's like to work at Elastic, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Slack, et cetera. And I'm always really excited to talk about it. I love working at Elastic. We are a fully remote engineering company and have been since before uh, the pandemic. So if you've been interested in remote work and want to learn more about it, uh, you can also talk to me. And I'm going to stop sharing. I believe that's it. Thank you all so much for hanging out and listening. Uh, I hope that was useful for you and I'm here for questions. Okay, everyone. So if you have questions for Jessica, uh, you can put your hand up. Um, so I know that you are interested in speaking, then we can hand you the mic. Any questions for Jessica? My cat well, has a question, which is where are the kibbles? I can hear them <laughs> going downstairs. I don't know if you can. <laughs> can hear, no. Um, well, some people are probably thinking of questions. In the meantime, um, I have a question. Yes. So first of all, I have to say that I love the good place references. <laughs> really nice and very, very relevant. Great show. <laughs> One of Very my favorite show. shows, yes. Um, so my question is that you talked a little bit in your presentation about um, how it's difficult to get people to post in public, um, to understand even some of the benefits of posting in public and to encourage them. So what are some ways that Elastic is trying to encourage people to post in public and be, and be comfortable yeah. with posting in public? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if we have like specific company mandates. I definitely have my own personal ones, which is like, if someone asks me a question that I know the answer to, it, it kind of depends on context, right? There are some times where I will answer it, but other times I'll be like, hey, there's other people who've asked me this question before. And I'd really like, I'd encourage you to post this in Sec Data Engine. I can post a response in there. And so that's our little data channel. Um, or in other kind of any other public channels and be like, hey, this is a really good place to ask this. I know other people have this question too. And again, just kind of being kind about it, not being like, I don't have time to answer you or like ignoring them until they post in some, some other place. I don't feel like that's a very um, productive way <laughs> to have people get, to get their questions answered. Um, but uh, yeah, I find that just Encourage and like also if someone asks me a question in Slack, I'll sometimes be like, oh, that's a really good question. This belongs in this GitHub issue. I'm going to link this there if you don't mind and like kind of guiding people there. Um, but it's definitely sometimes an uphill battle. I, I think that's just some people are more comfortable talking to you one on one because I think some people are really nervous about asking questions in public. And I know some people have had bad experiences where they ask a question in public and they end up getting 
this has not been in my experience at Elastic would be very clear, but at other companies, they'll be like, I got chewed out asking a question publicly and I'm just really nervous about it. So I find like just encouraging an atmosphere where it's okay to ask questions. Um, and I do find that in various places at Elastic, like uh, our infrastructure team is a great example. Like, I feel like they always had this like, no question is a stupid question attitude. Cause I'll come in, my teammates will come in, new people will come in being like, hey, why does this do this thing in Jenkins? And they're like, great question. And they'll explain it or they'll be like, you found a bug and open up a PR like five minutes later. And I feel like kind of experiencing that sort of openness has just made me be like, oh yeah, that's what I need to do as well. Like I need to help promote that and make sure people know they have a safe place to ask questions and gently guide them to like a better place if I feel it's necessary. But yeah, if someone just asked me like a quick question, like, hey, are my creds wrong? I'm like, yeah, they're wrong. Here, let me help you. And just really quickly like fix their um, fix their things. But yeah, I just feel like I, I try to also just be a force for good on Slack. <laughs> just be like, hey, let's let's move this over here. Is that okay? Is it, is it okay if we go over here? Yeah, the best way to encourage the right type of behavior is to model that behavior, right? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's at least my philosophy. And I feel like I'm in a place and at a company that respects that. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Um, I have one more question. Okay. So um, Elastic is a remote first company. Mm -hmm. um, and this was true since before the pandemic as well. So I'm just curious, what was your decision to decide to work for a remote first, first, a remote first company uh, what were some of the things that um, some of the factors in your decision and how are you enjoying it? That's a very, also a very good question. Um, so I joined Elastic in February of 2020, which as most of us know, was about four weeks before uh, Remote First became a much higher priority for a lot of companies. Um, I I was first and foremost attracted to the team. Um, I thought that the, the security team in general seemed really cool at Elastic. Um, but it was one of those things where I had a couple other offers from local Toronto companies. And I was like, I don't know, like at my last job, I really loved helping out with like social hours and things like that. And I really enjoyed like that kind of interaction with my colleagues. But ultimately I was like, you know what? I think the work is neat enough. I'm, I'm kind of excited that there will be opportunities to meet my coworkers in person. And I think this is the kind of challenge that I'm ready to take right now. Um, We'd also just gotten our cat and I was like, I have my little buddy at home. Like that seems really nice. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely went, went for it because I thought it would be an interesting new experience. Um, I, I did not know how prescient it would be <laughs> to be very clear, but I'm really, really enjoying it. I really think that e e if there hadn't been, oh, everybody has to stay at home. I'm, I'm thinking I would still feel the same way because I can run my own schedule. I have coworkers um, both five hours ahead of me and three hours behind me. So I've tried to shift my work schedule where some days I come in really early to make sure I overlap with my European colleagues. Other days I'll come in a little bit later and stay late to make sure I spend more time with my West Coast colleagues. And I find that having that kind of balance and sort of the freedom to do that has been really kind of eye-opening in terms of like what I, I can do to succeed in my job and like what makes me a successful engineer um, and how I can interact with people all over the world and like it, and have that kind of experience. So I'm really enjoying it. I do definitely miss human interaction. I'm looking forward to things opening up a little bit so I can meet my coworkers a little bit more face to face and have some more time with them. Uh, I definitely don't love only being at home to be very clear. Uh, so looking forward to have more excuses. Also to see all of you lovely people in person again. That would be nice to be able to have some of that. But yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, last call for Jessica. I'm going to give a couple more seconds. You can post it in the chat if you want me to ask it for you. Um, If not, then that's that's it. That's the end of that. So, oh, wait. Oh, yes. Oh, I, I posted in the chat like how you can find me if you uh, don't feel like asking questions right now. So always come find right. me. Yeah. And I will also post in the chat um, a link to Jessica's uh, previous video and a link to her slides. So um, here is a link to Jessica's previous talk with us. This is from her March talk. And 
uh, from our March event. And here is the link to Jessica's slides if you're interested in uh, reviewing them again. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica.